You're listening to Luke's English Podcast. For more information, visit teacherluke.co.uk. Hello, listeners, and welcome to the podcast. This is a new episode of Jill's Book Club. And on Jill's Book Club, as you may know, I talk to my mum about books. And I am talking again to my mum, Jill Thompson, about a specific book which you might want to read as part of your English learning routine. And uh, mum is here already. Hello, mum. Hello, Luke. How are you today? I'm all right. How are you? Not bad. Thank you very much. Nice day, isn't it? Yes, it is. Lovely, lovely day here. Same here, which is nice. Spring mm. has has sprung. Well, yeah, so it's still quite cold, actually, but uh, mm. it's getting there. Yeah, it's getting there. Right, so you know what, Mum? I'm going to do my introduction. Okay. Just so that, well, you know, I normally do a 15-minute <laughs> <laughs> introduction. Actually, you know what? The last episode of this podcast that I recorded, mm. I've just published it this morning, was an interview with um, Megan oh, yeah. Brady. Yeah. She used to be Megan Davies. Yeah. And <laughs> I actually recorded an introduction to that. My first introduction that I attempted was 45 minutes long. Oh, good grief. The reason is reason for that is that I just felt there were lots of things I needed to explain, lots of context mm, mm. that I thought my international audience of learners of English wouldn't know. Mm. And therefore there'd just be so many things they wouldn't understand in yeah. my conversation with Megan. So I felt I had to do this introduction and time flies so fast, <laughs> but I managed to edit it down. I like re-recorded it a number of times and I edited it down to something a bit more reasonable. Good. But there it is. Yeah. So anyway, um, the the Megan Brady interview has been published. And well, I just I thought actually, f- yeah, go on. I was just going to say, I look forward to hearing that because of course I re- it was my time. I remember the Apple Jacks very well. And what do you remember about actually meeting Megan? Was it kind of a a surprise? Yes, it was a surprise. And it was interesting to meet her, you know, as a just as an ordinary mum like me, <laughs> even though she'd had that interesting background. Well, this is not going to be a 45-minute no. introduction, I promise. No. Okay. Yeah, I'll get going. Okay. So, listeners, hello. Uh, Jill's Book Club, right? We're talking about books. And the book this time is all about the Beatles, which is a band from England that you might have heard of. So, the book, yeah, the book is called One, Two, Three, Four: The Beatles in Time by Craig Brown. Now, listeners, you could read this book, and if you did... I'm sure that you would learn plenty of things, both in terms of language and general knowledge. But there's no pressure to do so. If you like, you can just listen to this conversation with my mum, and hopefully this will be interesting and useful enough on its own. But if you are looking for a good book to read in English, then this one could be a good choice, and hopefully this conversation will help you understand the whole thing a bit more, which in turn should help you pick up more English from the book if you read it. So my advice is, listen to this conversation with my mum, and if you're inspired, get a copy of the book and read it. Or if you prefer, just listen to us without feeling any pressure to read the book at all. Hopefully this will still be enjoyable and interesting, even if you haven't read the book and have no plans to do so. Um, so over 700 episodes, mum, over over 700 episodes ago and 12 years ago in the third episode of this podcast, mm. I interviewed you about your memories of seeing the Beatles performing live on stage in the 1960s, which you did twice. Yeah, <laughs> famously, yes. 1963 and 1964. Yes, you know, I'd completely forgotten that you'd interviewed me on that subject. Uh, I suppose, how, so when was that? How many years ago? That was 2009, April 2009. Oh, crikey. 11 years ago, is that? It's 12 years ago. Gosh. Yeah. Okay, well, and here we are again. Okay, yeah. we're, we're we're going to talk about the band again. This time, focusing on this book, mm-hmm. which is all about the Beatles phenomenon and their place in history. Exactly. That's why it's so interesting. Yeah. That's why it's so interesting. The the book. Yeah. I, I'm still doing my introduction. Sorry, carry on. 
<laughs> the plan is to review the book as a text for learners of English and then have a deeper discussion about the Beatles. So listeners, you probably know that I'm a big fan of the Beatles and I grew up with their music as my parents were and still are, I think, fans too. For years, I've been thinking about doing more episodes about the Beatles story and kind of mentally preparing myself for it, but I have never actually got round to recording anything, mainly because the topic is just too big and there's too much to say. But finally, I have actually recorded some episodes that might scratch the surface of this topic a bit, and hopefully will give you something insightful and interesting to listen to, whether you're a fan of this band or whether you, you know almost nothing about them at all. So this is going to be the first in a series of episodes in which I talk about Beatle-related things. And uh, there's this one with my mum, and then a few episodes with another guest who is an English teacher and something of an expert on the Beatles, and John Lennon in particular. So Beatle episodes are coming, listeners. And uh, I suppose for some of you, episodes about the Beatles are like buses. You wait ages for one, and then loads of them arrive at the same time. And by the way, I'm certainly not forgetting the main focus of this podcast, which is all about helping you learn English. I think the Beatles can help you learn English. Reading is very important in learning English. And so why not do some reading about the Beatles? Plus, later in this Beatles series, there will be some language focused episodes using the Beatles as a context, focusing on some specific descriptive vocabulary and also some analysis of the Beatles song lyrics. So those are episodes that will be coming later in this kind of mini series I'm going to be doing uh, about the Beatles. Now, maybe you're not a fan of the Beatles. This is fine. I'm not going to try and convince you that you should like their music. That's a matter of taste. But I do think that their story is something else entirely. I think it's hard to deny the fact that the story of these four individuals the things that happened to them, and the impact that they had on the world. This is all simply fascinating, I think. It's an epic story. So even if you don't like the music, I hope you stay just for the story. So now let's let's start this episode of Jill's Book Club properly, talking about a recently published book about the Beatles. So, Mum, you, are you still there? You haven't fallen asleep or no, anything? No, I'm still here. Okay. All right, then. So should we talk about the book then? Oh, well, yeah, I think that's the idea. That's the general idea, isn't it? <clears throat> oh, sorry. I've got a bit of a frog in my throat. Really? <clears throat> yes. It's causing you to cough slightly. Yeah. That's a nice English expression. Isn't it? To have mm. a frog in your throat. It's like, <clears throat> excuse me, I've got a frog in my throat. I'm sure, I bet in other languages they have different things in I their throats. I bet they do, yeah. I th- I th- some languages, I think they have a cat in their throat. Mm. I don't know if that's French. Well, it's just my way, really, of saying sorry if I'm if I cough or clear my throat a lot. That's the reason right. why. <clears throat> well, I, I might be able to edit those things out. <laughs> yes. You're going to give me some extra work there, editing homework. Um, okay, so one, two, three, four: The Beatles in Time by mm. Craig Brown. Mm. So, what do you reckon? Can you summarise this book? <laughs> <laughs> well, I can tell you my sort of impression of it. I mean, I was most impressed. Because it's not just about the Beatles, that's the main thing. It's called The Beatles in Time, which the time refers not only to the musical time, timing, but the time in which they lived. So the con- it contextualizes it. And the fascinating thing is that it all happened so quickly. It just happened in 10 years. And they were all so young. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I would have realized that at the time, of course, but you don't sort of see it in that way when you're young yourself. But, you know, looking back on it, and they were so young. How on earth did they cope with it all? And it's just fascinating because it shows how there's a whole mythology that's been built up around the Beatles and how everybody's got a different story about the same event very often. And, uh, of course, it's always fascinating to read about them and the things they did and where they came from and all that sort of thing. It's, um, and I think it would be a, a very good book for English learners. Why do you say that? Well, I suppose partly because of Craig Brown's style. I mean, it's very informal and very conversational. It's not academic or complicated in any way. Uh, would you agree? I would agree entirely, yeah. Uh, let's talk then about the appropriacy of the book for learners of English. Okay. Because um, as, as I guess we are reviewing 
first and foremost here we are reviewing this book mm. as a potential you know book for my for my listeners yeah in terms of its appropriacy the language as exactly as you say it's sort of modern it's plain in style you say it's quite informal and you do there is there are some chapters in the book where craig appears to be almost writing in his diary yes sort of writing diary entries about for example his experiences of going to liverpool yes and visiting certain what are now tourist attractions and we're talking about paul mccartney's childhood home john lennon's childhood home and other sort of key locations in liverpool it's so strange to think that i think it's fourth lynn road isn't it where paul was yes. brought up and mendips mm. where john was brought up how they mm -hmm. now belong to the national trust it just seems bizarre because most of the National Trust buildings are sort of grand houses and gardens and so on. Downton Abbey type places. That's right. Yeah, normally, <laughs> yeah, the country's yeah most splendid uh, properties. They tend to, most of the National Trust properties tend to be a celebration of architecture or art or landscaping, whereas Fourth Lynn Road and Mendips they're just ordinary houses where people lived who became famous. It's very different from the usual run of National Trust. Are these the only National Trust properties that are completely ordinary, except for the for the people who live there? I think there are a couple of others. I think there's one in Nottingham called, I think it's called Mr. Straw's House. And it's a, the house of an ordinary person. I mean, I don't know because I've never been, but... Um, I think it's interesting because he never changed it. As far as I can remember, he never changed anything in his house. So it exists in the state that it did when he lived there. So it is, in a way, it's a sort of an architectural example or interior design type example, you know, to take you back to see what houses were like in those days. But, I mean, as with the Beatles' houses, of course, they'd been changed by – subsequent owners who'd modernised them. So the National Trust had to demodernise them in lots of ways. So I gather. I mean, I haven't seen them, but that's what yeah. I think is the case. But going back to those chapters where Craig Brown is describing his yeah. trip to Liverpool and visiting these 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 houses, yeah, it's very funny the way he talks about how the tour guide points out certain things, like, you know, this is the um, – this is a teapot. Mm. And and it's not the original teapot that Paul and his dad and his brother would have drunk tea from, uh, but it's like the teapot. So he's kind of in this weird situation of like, here's a kind of replica, not and everyone's taking photos yeah. of this teapot, which was never used by Paul McCartney, um, but it's kind of close to being <laughs> like the teapot <laughs> that he would have used, and also like you know that yeah exactly they've they've made those houses look as close to how they would have looked and people are kind of wandering around looking at them i don't know so it's like a recreation but in this place where it happened yeah. it's very bizarre it is strange the whole st the whole story is strange yeah it certainly is but anyway so the yeah. style of language it's modern it's plain in style yeah. it's quite literary of course because it's a book mm. i mean uh, yeah. you know Books are – the language you get from books is not exactly the same as language which is used in conversation and stuff, but still. Yeah, um, I suppose so. It's not a screenplay no. or something like that which has dialogue in it. it there, there are there are one or two bits of dialogue, aren't there? There are, actually. Yeah. yeah there, it's quite interesting in in its diversity. There are yeah. The different chapters have diff slightly different styles, so there are some chapters where you get – lots of extracts from letters to the Beatles from their fans mm. and other things. So yeah, it's good in, in the sense that there's a, a very diverse range of styles, but generally speaking, it's clearly written. It should be readable for learners with an upper intermediate level or above, mm. although there, there will be some difficult words in there, of course, but that's good. Um, I, I would say that the overall, overall the style is modern, neutral, and definitely the kind of English that I would recommend as a good model of English for my listeners. Yeah. Um, it's quite long. This is one issue. I've got the paperback version. Yeah. And it's 642 pages long. Well, I've got the hardback and it's, uh, how many, how many pages in yours? 642. Oh, I've got 600 and, 
42. All right. There you go. So, yeah. It's pretty, it's pretty, pretty hefty book. It is. But. Yeah. But it doesn't read like a hefty book because it's so easy to read and because it's split up into very short chapters. I just zoomed through it at the beginning of lockdown, you know, last year, about 14 months ago. Mm. And it's the last book I've been able to zoom through during the whole period because I've kind of lost my reading mojo during uh, COVID. But this one I read without any problem at all. Couldn't put it down. Short chapters mm. uh, are the thing. So even though it's long, it's divided into short chapters. Each chapter is only a few pages long. Mm. Some chapters are even one page long in some cases. Mm. And this this does make the whole thing quite easy to digest. It's in bite-sized chunks. You can dip into it and you don't necessarily have to read it in order. No, because it's that's another thing about it. It's not chronological, strictly chronological, like a lot of biographies are. Overall, I think it is generally mm. chronological, although it shifts around. Mm. So it'll skip, you know, back a few years or forward a few years and stuff. But overall, I think the general sweep of it is quite chronological. The thing that struck me very strongly when I was reading it was the thing about Brian Epstein, the way he treats his life and death. At the beginning, he doesn't really say an awful lot about him at the beginning of the book. And then do yeah. you remember at the end of the book, there's like a sort of strange diary of dates yeah. of things that the, the things that Brian was going through. Cause that's another thing I learned just how disturbed Brian Epstein was and how it destroyed him really the whole thing. Yeah. So he's hardly mentioned really in any great detail until the end when there's this mixed up chronology um, explaining his death and how it came about and how paranoid he became. Is it not a sort of like a, 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 a backwards uh, history? It's not entirely backwards. It, it no. jumps about backwards and forwards. Um, listeners, Brian Epstein or Epstein was the Beatles manager. And yeah, the thing about the Beatles story is that there are many stories in, involved. That's why I said it was kind of epic because it's not just the story of the four individual Beatles, but there are so many other people involved and you can follow like these people kind of enter the story and somehow the, um, the experience of being part of this whirlwind of the, of the Beatles changed people's lives and sent them off on some odd, bizarre, sometimes tragic trajectories. The Beatles story is, is a, Yes, it's kind of a swirling storm of many people. Well, the Beatles story is like a metaphor almost, or a, it's the 60s, that decade, from the early 60s to the early 70s, where everything changed, seemed to change so quickly and so strongly and radically, yes. And, um, you know, that's what happened to a lot of people at that time, and they are just a sort of microcosm of what was happening it's it's a bit tricky to know whether the the Beatles were a, 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 an agent that f created some of those changes, or whether they were just part of those changes mm. too. Mm. What, bit what of you both, reckon? I think. Bit of both. Bit of both. Yeah, I mean that whole period is very interesting, and I don't really know enough about it to be able to say anything definitely. But things socially, things changed so much in that decade. And, yes. uh, of course, they were in the middle of it all. There are probably many factors mm. that caused society, certainly in England, in America, in, you know, in, 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 well, I guess kind of the world, really, because the Beatles were a global phenomenon. But, the, but anyway, many factors that, that probably brought about significant changes. Um, one of them being, um, like, uh, television. Mm hmm. You know, the, the fact that it was possible to uh, broadcast, mm. um, you know, television uh, to many places. And in fact, the Beatles were the first, you know, they were part of the first international live televised broadcast mm. in 1967 when they sang All You Need Is Love yeah. and it was broadcast all around the world I simultaneously. Well. You know, so are interesting that the the Beatles and TV kind of go hand in hand, but also mass media is, is basically what I'm talking about, mm. that mass media communication got to a certain point uh, where something like the Beatles phenomenon was possible. Mm. 
you know like certain conditions came to came into being which allowed the beatles phenomenon to happen yeah and one of those things was yeah mass media um another one was was the uh i guess the baby boom the the rising birth rate after mm. world war 2 which which um most of the fans were part of that generation yeah suddenly there were many more young people right mm. and um young people who whose parents had been through world war 2 and and the parents of you know and their grandparents had been through world war 1 mm. the first half of the the 20th century was a horrible horrible mm. time mm. uh you know with the um financial crash and you know everything that happened in the first half of the 20th century was just just terrible really mm. and for the first time you know in the in, you know in the wake of world war 2 and and the, the the sort of i don't know the relief that spread around many parts of the world a lot of young people grew up in that context i mean it's a weird mix of sort of peace and relief mm. i suppose but also that sense that this could happen again and you know the cold war was in the background i don't know what yeah, I'm, and I don't know what Viet- I'm and the vietnam war in america yeah that was um, slightly le- that was later than the start of that was part of the beatles time of course but it it all happened a bit later they came to prominence in the 1962 63 the early 60s yeah i mean it's a very very complex uh, subject must do some study on it sometime mm, yeah but i i'm you know i'm sure that certain other things as well like maybe birth control i don't know if that had anything to do with it you know a sense of women's liberation mm. you know what i mean like just certain social conditions i think were in place mm. and uh, which created a sort of wave of mm. change and the beatles were either riding the wave or they were part of the wave you know f- giving it momentum i don't know and there was um employment was very easy to find as well in the early 60s you know you could just leave school and get a job yeah. And I suppose people had young people had more disposable income. Yeah, I don't know. There's just lots and lots of elements to it. Absolutely, and you know what was going on musically in America, and you know even even things like the invention of electric guitars. Mm. Yeah, and and how that had a huge impact, and how rock and roll became a thing, mm. and amplified electric mm. guitars. Mm. Uh, which had never been possible before, and that created a whole other kind of music. And it was it was music that could be played loud to large audiences of people, which created different forms of music, like dance music, rock and roll music, and also the way in which uh, records could be printed and distributed, right? So previous generations hadn't had that to the same degree. I mean, there were vinyl records and um well, gramophones and stuff in in, right? in my youth my you know childhood we used to have a record player it was a wind up record player and the records we used to play on it were my father's uh, classical records and they were all they weren't vinyl what was that stuff that they used to be made of it was very heavy each individual record was incredibly heavy Bakelite, I don't know, some weird material that you don't see it now. And the records were extremely fragile. You had to be careful with them because if you dropped them, they'd break. And uh, vinyl didn't come in until, oh, I don't know. It was certainly about the same time, you know, end of the 50s, early 60s, I suppose. Interesting. You know, Mm. just these are structural changes Mm. that allowed cultural things to kind of happen Mm. you know and and that also relates to the way in which vinyl records were made in the usa so we're talking about sort of rock and roll and blues and and stuff like that and country records which made their way to liverpool and particularly to liverpool because liverpool was a port exactly people come came into liverpool from america yeah it was a sort of access point a communication point with america and um yeah lots of people merchant seamen 
John Lennon's dad was a was a, was a merchant yeah. seaman. Yeah. Um, not that John Lennon's dad brought him records because well, no. he wasn't there. <laughs> Didn't bring him anything. Didn't bring him anything. Yeah, but yeah, a lot of a lot of stuff, a lot of culture got imported into Liverpool, which allowed the Beatles to actually access these these bits of music in you know maybe before other kids in other parts of the country you know a lot of these factors basically were were part of it oh i actually listened to the audiobook version of 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 this book right who read it uh different actors ah which is I love that in audiobooks when yes. you get a, a cast of different mm. um, voiceover artists. So different chapters, you know, there, there were the author himself, I think, does some of those diary style chapters mm. where he's, you know, describing his, his trips to, to Liverpool. And then there are different actors doing other parts. There's one woman, I don't know who it is, but she's doing many of the chapters that have female voices in them including the voices of the fans she's brilliant at doing the, the voices of the american fans yeah these teenage american girls who are so kind of oh how do i describe it emotional <laughs> emotional and so kind of possessive and, yeah um <laughs> yeah. demanding demanding and uh, just yeah teenage girls so and also some very good impressions of the people involved oh yeah so every time every time paul is speaking you get the the voice actor starts doing a paul impression i mean he doesn't do it as well as you do i don't know and you know whenever john speaks it's sort of you know he sounds like this yeah so that was quite enjoyable i love beetle impressions Mm. so generally yes uh, overall i think it's really appropriate for learners of english in terms of its style and stuff um and you can you can kind of it's in bite-sized chunks, so it's not too overwhelming. Mm. I, w- I would say. One thing: why is it why is it called one, two, three, four? Yeah, well, I suppose because uh, one, two, three, four. It's the, the musical timing that they start, and there's one. I saw her standing there, isn't it, where Paul shouts one, two, three, four. She was just seventeen. You know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> so it must have been the timing that they did a lot of their songs in, I suppose. And yeah, also, there exactly. were four of them: one, two, three, four Beatles. Exactly. Yeah, I mm. think the, the the I saw her standing there is the first track on their first album. Not their is first it? single, mm. yeah, but it's the first track, side one of of Please Please Me. Right. One, two, three, four. Dun, 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 dun. So maybe it's sort of like an introduction into. Yeah, yeah. You know, their, their it, that was my favourite Beatles song for a long time. Really? Yeah. <laughs> what, what did you think of that line? in the song she was just 17 you know what i mean yeah what did did <laughs> well, you know what the, he meant at the time it probably never occurred to me but i know what it means now it's because she's over 16 so she's um you know <laughs> able to have sex <laughs> yeah lots of references to sex in the Beatles yeah. songs like fail even like please please me which is their second yeah. single yeah was it the first number one it's all yes about i sex, think uh it? no what about um Oh God, I can't remember. What was the first? Well, the first one was um, do, 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 "Love Me Do." Love Me Do. Yeah, that's the uh, one where they had. There's like three different versions with three different drummers. That's right. And did um, did that not get to number one? No, I suppose it didn't. No, it no. it didn't. No. Um, but please, please me, please, please me did. And like, you know, the story goes that John had written it in a sort of Roy Orbison style. Mm. Come on come on you know won't you please that kind of thing it was really slow and george was like you know um you know george martin Mm. their producer who had this cut glass posh english accent even though he wasn't even though he was working class yeah yeah it's a sign of the times yes very much so so um you know i think maybe it would be better if we'd sped it up a bit john (laughs) and and so they sped it up and it's i mean we're going to talk about some of the individuals involved in the story but george martin is so important oh he was the fifth beetle they wouldn't have got anywhere near as far as they did without him yeah they sped up the song and after they'd recorded it apparently george said over the intercom you've just recorded your first number one boys (laughs) and sure enough they it was their first number one yeah (laughs) <laughs> um, I like the story that um, when Brian Epstein was touting them round, you know, in the early days before they'd got a record contract. Trying to sell them to Trying to sell them to all companies. sorts of different recording companies. And when somebody said, oh, try George Martin at Parlophone. 
and his heart sank because he thought this is as low as we've got now because George Martin was famous for doing sort of comedy records and, you know, <laughs> nothing very prestigious. Yeah, he, he recorded The Goons, yeah. The Goon Show, which now, with the benefit of hindsight, is an incredibly significant yes. thing. The, the Goons, which were this comedy trio who did radio comedy shows, they're a hugely influential yeah. and really significant um, moment in British sort of popular culture mm. and and kick-started so many things in comedy, like Monty Python's Flying Circus, mm. Uh, owe a lot to Spike Milligan, particularly. Who and was the one writer. thing I was interested in was apparently when George Martin met them and when they did their first test for him, he wasn't terribly impressed with them musically, but then they had a coffee or something afterwards and he was very impressed with their personalities. He said they were, you know, um, so funny and so witty and that's why he signed them. That's the story in the book. And I can yeah. understand that because that was m one of the main reasons I loved them so much because they were so witty and clever and funny and full of life. Yeah. So. I can just hear George Martin's voice in my head at this yeah. point because I've seen all the interviews and stuff. And oh, I yeah. can just imagine him going, I, you know, when I first heard them, I wasn't awfully impressed by the music, but it was when we had a coffee together in the canteen. <laughs> I was bowled over by their humour and their repartee. <laughs> I thought these boys really have got something. <laughs> and the, the, the story goes that, like uh, George Martin said to the the group after they'd recorded their first thing, you know, um, what do you think? Just let me know if there's anything you'd like to change. Hmm. And George Harrison was like, "Yeah, I don't like your tie. <laughs> I don't like your tie for a start. <laughs> so cheeky." <laughs> 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 you can change your tie <laughs> and um and uh yeah they were so cheeky but they got away with it i mm. don't know they were so lovable and mm. i think george really liked it yeah yeah and that was so important that he was a, a comedy guy mm. george martin because he did have a sort of a kind of what's the word for it subversive side to him george mm. martin mm. A, a kind of eclectic subversive side which linked with the Beatles really well mm. and meant that he was willing to roll with the punches or kind of go with the flow when mm. they started to experiment a lot more. And he yeah. was a lot more willing. He was so willing to be different and original and yeah. experimental. And he wasn't judgmental of them at all, which a lot of people yeah. might have been. Let's see. What I'd like to do now, mum, is mm. just ask you various little questions about the, uh, about the Beatles and this book. Uh -huh. And, um, talk about some of the, the key people, certain people. We've mentioned George Martin and Brian Epstein. We we may come back to them. Yeah. Let's let, okay. Let's go into the people mm -hmm. at this point. So uh, the question is, how do the key people come out of the the book? And you know, we could ramble a little bit about each person. Mm. So uh, we'll start with John. You know, John, mm. Paul, George, and Ringo. We'll start mm. with John. How do you think John comes out of the this, this book? Well, not terribly surprisingly, really. It's what you'd expect. I mean, it's just an ampli, in my view, an amplification of what we already know about him, that he was incredibly, um, he had a real chip on his shoulder. He was very mixed up about all sorts of things, wasn't very confident despite his um, bravado and how much he needed other people. I mean, he definitely needed Paul, I think. And, yeah. um I mean, he was terrible to some people. I mean, the way he treated his wife was appalling. And But at the moment he met Yoko, this very strong woman who knew what she wanted, she just got him and that was it. And he was much, well, I don't know whether he was happier with her, but she was the sort of woman he wanted because she was strong and she, you know, just said, we're going to do this, we're going to do that, we're going to do the other. And he just said, oh, all right. But um, I, I don't know, he didn't seem to me, it's you know it sort of amplifies the fact that he doesn't didn't have a very strong psyche. What do you think? <laughs> I'm not explaining yeah, I, it very well. I would agree. I mean, to be honest, I'm going to go into quite a lot of detail about John oh. uh, in, in forthcoming. <laughs> Everybody episodes. always does. Oh, we, oh yeah, another I, one. Yes, okay. I've got forthcoming episodes. Oh, okay. We need yeah. to be focused on John. I mean, mm. you know, it, it, it's hmm, what can I say? 
Um, yeah, we people have talked about John and it, and written books about John, and it's all John, 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 isn't yeah, it? A lot yeah. of the time, one does get a bit fed up a bit every now and then. But one thing, uh, not in the book. I'm sorry to divert, but the recent interview that um, Adam Buxton did with Paul McCartney was very interesting because Paul was talking about the difference in his childhood and the difference in Paul's childhood, in John's John. childhood, how John had a very difficult childhood with his mother des- mother and father deserting him, really, and him being brought up by his aunt. And uh, he didn't really, you know, it was just him, really, and uh, his aunt and her husband who, who died uh, early. So John had loads of deaths in his family to deal with. Yeah. And um, whereas Paul came from this sort of fair, well, not large, but large-ish family which had music you know music was very important and they all used to join together and sing songs and it was a very happy stable childhood and he said that he didn't realize until he was really quite old <laughs> why john was the way he was it was because his early days were so difficult and paul's were so you know good except the one thing which kind of really brought them close to each oh, other yeah, paul and john yeah. is that they both lost they both lost their mothers yes so it's a weird kind of yin and yang situation yeah. where the you know on john's side to a large extent his family life was rough and tough and he as you said his his father left home his mum couldn't really look after him and so he was brought up by his aunt and his mum wasn't in his life for many years until later when he was a teenager she kind of came back into his life and then she died mm. in an accident. Mm. So, but generally, John's life was kind of pretty tough on an emotional level. Mm. Let's say mm. St- emotional stability was not quite there. Whereas Paul's life was um, was much more stable, you know, emotionally stable, and as you said, happier, and you know, with a bigger family, and you know, much more warmth and stuff. But the thing that united them was the fact they both lost their mothers. Mm. So you've got the sort of like the, the more tough emotional side and the, the, the more warm emotional side, but then the thing that links them together mm. um, is, is the, the, the they lost their mothers. I mean, we're painting a fairly a broad picture here. I mm. think that John did experience, you know, warmth and loving moments in his, in his upbringing, uh, but not entirely. Yeah. Mm. But I mean, John, I mean, if we, you know, just saying things about John, I mean, you know, when you start to talk about his psychology and his life, it all seems very kind of rough and tough and miserable. And that was definitely present in his life. But for me as a fan and for, for many other people, the version of John that we see in his songs and in his interviews and other things is, is different. And it's, he is so funny mm. and he has a sort of, charisma oh yeah and he had a voice like the way he used to speak yeah he was very articulate very intelligent and um he could kind of grab you with his with his voice oh yes i was very impressed with him in the early days something fascinating about listening to him he's one of those people that you just want to listen to Mm. and he had a he had a way of putting things yeah so, yeah, a, a complicated character, as we'll explore on this podcast <laughs> yes. soon. <laughs> in some, in some, yeah, you better some leave length. it for that one. Not, yeah. <clears throat> keep your powder dry for that one. Yeah. What about Paul then? What about Paul McCartney? <laughs> because, you know, he's arguably more fascinating than John. Yeah. Because, you know, we haven't really explored Paul in the same way that we've explored John. Well, no, I mean, John gets all the attention. F- for all the reasons we've said, but also because he died young, of course. So we have no idea what he'd be like now if he was the same age, if he was still alive now, same age as Paul, you know, what would he be like? It's very hard to tell. And what what would his experiences post the age of 40 have been like? What would he have done? And and um, it would have, you know, it would have been very interesting because Paul is, has got more and more interesting as he's got older, I think. mm Certainly. So we'll we'll never know really with John. That's the thing with people who live live young and die young, because he you know he'd been through a, a lot of pain and suffering in his life, and it seems as though he was just coming out of all that when he was killed. So mm. we don't know, but he might have carried on being a complete nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, it would have been interesting. Yeah. But Paul, yeah, in- yeah. very interesting character. Sorry, I'm doing the voice again. I know. Um, yes, it's, it's uh, he is. He is fascinating. And uh, it, by all accounts, is a decent guy, you know, interesting. And, uh, you know, the famous story of my brother bumping into him in a shop in um, in Sussex, in Rye, when he yes. was really nice and friendly and normal. Yeah, which is a good, it's a good sign, isn't it? it? That like Nick just was in the shop. He was in the queue. He noticed there was something going on. I think Paul was. Paul was talking. His card had been refused or there was some issue with payment. Oh, no, I I thought it was. He heard a voice behind him, someone talking on their phone. Uh Turned around and it was Paul. I don't know. I can't remember. But apparently the end result was that Nick turned around, realised who it was and said, oh, hello, Paul, <laughs> you know, the way you would, because you feel as though you know these people. <laughs> and, and instead of being all hoity-toity, Paul said, hello, you know, what are you doing here? And they had this <laughs> conversation about birds and photography and things. Really pleasant. Yeah, I think, yeah, exactly. That, yeah, oh, I'd love to meet Paul McCartney. Mm. I'm just... You know, I, I would try not to be like, oh, wow, Paul McCartney, you're so <laughs> important in my life. Instead, I'd be like, all right, Paul, <laughs> how are you doing? Yeah. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. He seems to be, he seems to make an effort to, to keep his feet on the ground and to be a normal person. The, one bit about Paul's life, which I, which was good in the book, was um, in the early days when he was going out with Jane Asher. And, of course, Jane Asher was very well known, and I I thought Jane Asher was wonderful. She was a young actress when I was young. I suppose Mm. we're similar ages. She must be a bit older than me. And I thought she was great because she was so beautiful with this long ginger hair and everything. Anyway, it seemed perfectly right that he should be going out with Jane. They made this wonderful couple. And Mm. as Craig um, Brown goes into the story that uh, he was sort of, Paul was sort of adopted by her family, which was very, um, it was quite wealthy and cultured and uh, well-educated and intellectual and all the rest of it. And they, they, well, they gave him a, a room in their house and he lived with them for several years and they introduced him to all sorts of things. I think he must have had a great education from them. And then, yeah. of course, he blew it all. Nobody, they were engaged. They were going to get married. And then something happened. The rumor is that he had an affair with someone and she found them or something, something horrendous like that. And you feel like saying, oh, for heaven's sake, Paul, <laughs> why did you do that? Why did you throw all that away? Yes. Sorry, I think there's going to be a postal delivery. Oh. I think we've got an Amazon guy who will refuse to climb the stairs. So you'll have to go know. rushing down the stairs to pick it up. Yeah. So bear with me, but, but this is good. Jane yeah. Asher, we'll have to hold that thought. Okay. Okay. Just bear with me. Sorry. Yeah. Oh yeah. Sorry about that. Right. <laughs> I'm amazed you can do that. You ran all the way down and all the way up. Yeah. A hundred steps. Oh, must be keeping you fit. Yeah. That's the, probably the only thing. <laughs> Keeping me fit. Yeah. So, um, well, it was a package for the wife, but also uh-huh. Amazon delivered some bass guitar strings. Uh-huh. Okay, cool. Right. So we were talking about Jane Asher and I, I'm, yeah, it's a pity, I guess it didn't work out because they seem perfect for each other. Oh, they were, there was, and they were such a lovely looking couple, you know. But then he met Linda, and Linda seemed even more perfect for him. Yes, she obviously was. Yeah, yeah. I think their marriage is—you can only, you know—it can only be described as a huge success. I was so impressed in sort of the same time that I had, you know, that was bringing my kids up. That he was—I was impressed that he stayed in England. And she sent his kids to local schools and he didn't treat them differently. He didn't send them away to some posh private school and all the rest of it. Unlike John, who ran away to America saying that he couldn't have a decent life in England. Um, it's the biggest crime that you can commit <laughs> for the English. He moved to America. But it was just so ironic that she said, you know, nobody leaves me alone in England. In America, I can walk about, you know, and nobody pesters me. In New York, yeah, but ultimately, the, yeah. Hmm. There is, there is a, I have to say, there is a thing among the English, which is that when any English stars 
musicians, actors, comedians, whatever, go to America, then we don't like that. <laughs> <laughs> so they went to, he went to live in America. Um, you know, Ringo, Ringo as well. I don't know. I think that they can do whatever they want. Really. Ringo, I didn't realize that Ringo was planning to go to America anyway. I learned that from the book. That's a very interesting moment in the story. Yeah, yeah I didn't. I, I think I didn't know that Ringo had planned to move to America too. Mm. Yeah, Ringo was planning to move to America mm. anyway before even the Beatle thing happened. And this story made me think of two things. One is the impossibility of understanding history in hindsight, and the other one is the butterfly effect. Mm. Right. Yeah. So. If this hadn't happened, then that wouldn't have happened, that sort of yeah, thing. Yeah, the, the the history thing. Actually, the Ringo story, him moving to America, is not really, it's not really appropriate to the truth of history point I'm making. Mm-hmm. So the point I'm trying to make about the, the impossibility of understanding history in hindsight is this, that it seems it's extremely difficult to write a comprehensive narrative of things that happened in the past, because it's like, it's like Rashomon, the the Akira Kurosawa film. I don't know if you know that film. No, I don't. It's ba- basically in the film that the film tells a story from I think about four people's perspectives, and the four different versions of the same event are all very different. Yeah. Right. It, it's an interesting film in that it uses this narrative device of telling the same story a number of times from different people's perspectives yes. and from each perspective, it's, it's like a totally different story. Yes. And this is certainly the case with the Beatles, because as you said earlier, different people have got different accounts of what happened, like the moment when they met Elvis <laughs> Yes. and they all remember it differently. Yes. You know, little things like um, remembering what Priscilla Presley was wearing and different people have got radically different memories. So like yeah. some of them where she was wearing a ball gown, some of them she was wearing a tiara, some of them she had her hair done up. Yeah. I mean, that's a small thing, but also just generally it seems that it's very hard to capture history. Mm. And another one is that is I'm talking too much here, but John Lennon, um, it's a, it's a, it's a, what's the word for it? It's a rather negative moment in the story, but there is a moment where John, cause he couldn't handle his drink. And when he drank too much, he would lose control. And there was one occasion when he got violent and he beat someone up. Yeah. And the, this story of him um, attacking Bob Wooler, mm. which John, you know, really regretted later on. And, uh, you know, arguably he was, he didn't know what he was doing because he, he'd been drinking. Not that it's forgivable, but anyway, he assaulted a guy mm. and different Historians, different writers, different witnesses have r- told this story many times. And in most cases, the specific events are more or less the same mm. that John attacked Bob and X, Y, and Z happened. Uh, but the choice of words used to describe what happened give the events a totally different tone or color. And some writers like Albert Goldman, who wrote arguably a very salacious account of John Lennon's life. Right focusing on certain negative and you know shocking things yeah his version of the story you know there's murderous intent involved yes the suggestion is that john is trying to kill him mm. and then other versions of the story are less dramatic even though the events are still the same mm. so you know just different different um tellings of the of events totally uh influence the way that those events are remembered and retold later and that's one of the really interesting things about this book that he really sh- uh, Craig Brown really points that out how everybody's got a different version of almost every part of the Beatles lives um and he by he illustrates that by you know giving the different interpretations in some cases and it is fascinating i mean it starts out of course with the, all the guides in the um the Beatles houses telling a certain version of their childhood. And then when they're contradicted in any way, they get very cross because their version of the story is the right one and they won't accept that maybe there are other versions of the story. Yeah. Like history history or events are like multidimensional, mm. you know, like three-dimensional, let's say. But whenever you tell mm. an account of something that happened, it makes it two-dimensional. Mm. 
Do you, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, like in describing uh, John Lennon's upbringing, and you do it in a few sentences, you end up saying that he had a tough upbringing, that there was no emotional stability and stuff like that. And it's not in the, the, not the full story because I think that to some extent he did have a loving family to an extent. Well, me, it seems as though Mimi was very good and she, you know, she was a very stabilizing influence. And his uncle, Mimi's husband, by all accounts, was uh, a great influence on him. But of course he died while John was there. So that must have been another shock. Every, John must have started thinking that everyone he loved was going to die you know any minute yeah well paul mccartney has said in interviews that paul that that john told him that he believed that he was cursed Mm. that john believed that he had some kind of curse on him Mm. um especially over the male members of his family that Mm. everyone any kind of people that got really close to him would die and so yeah again we're talking about john but Mm. um a uh an interesting character that on the surface he had some level of kind of you know control and stability but then under the surface with john he was so vulnerable so sensitive so insecure mm. and and maybe this is what sort of makes him quite a compelling person that those insecurities and vulnerabilities come through quite quite easily and it comes through in his voice and his in, in his songwriting and, and things like this. And this, this is the thing that makes him very kind of engaging for mm. people that it's quite easy to latch onto him emotionally, that, that there's a lot of emotional expression or need coming through. And it's, again, it takes me back to that interview with Adam Buxton and Paul, how Paul saying, you know, how he realized why he realizes now why John was the way he was. And he also regrets that he's not, he said, you know, if John had still been around, he would have had conversations with John, now they're older, saying, look, have a look back on it. I realise now what all this was about, you know, And because you don't. It's only when you get older that you, you certainly realise what things are about and why people do things. It's such a shame that you have to wait until you're old before you understand these things. And he said, you know, that he would, if he was there now, he'd just give him a big hug, you know, but he couldn't do it then when they were younger because John would have, had a fit but um you know it's it's very sad (laughs) that whole thing anyway absolutely the other thing and this is what relates to the to the ringo uh planning to move to america is the butterfly effect yes so just just for the listeners just to kind of clarify so before um i guess even before he joined the beatles because he actually joined the beatles very late just before they they started recording (laughs) with EMI just before they started releasing, you know, published uh, music, um, you know, Ringo was not in the band. Not but until, he was already so. a professional musician by then. But he was, a, yeah, exactly. He was a professional musician and um, the others looked up to him because he was in the, the biggest band in, in Liverpool and uh, he'd been playing professional gigs for a long time and he was great. So while Ringo was was a professional musician, but before joining the Beatles, he was planning to move to America. He was thinking, oh, you know, I don't know, don't know if I'm going to carry on this music thing. I think I might go to America and get a job. I don't know where. No, I don't, I don't te- know. Texas, Texas, I think, somewhere, <laughs> no? Or was that? I don't, I'm not sure. Anyway, but he was planning to move. And he was serious about it. And uh, he did all of the stuff and he, he got the paperwork to apply for residency permits or work permits or something. And the paperwork was just too much for him. And he decided not to do it because Ringo, I mean, he, uh, he was very ill growing up uh, and he didn't go to school. And um, so, you know, doing something like filling in a very complicated application form, and those mm-hmm. things, those sorts of things are very complicated. Yeah. And they also, they require you to provide lots and lots of information about other members of the family. And mm. so for whatever reason, Ringo felt this was a bit overwhelming for him and he decided not to do it. But um, he came that close. He was so close mm. to, to emigrating. Mm. And of course, if he had emigrated, then the whole thing probably wouldn't have happened. Mm. I don't think the Beatles could have been the Beatles we know today with someone else because Ringo was an integral part of it, but the butterfly effect. So what I'm saying is that tiny, seemingly inconsequential moments have huge, long-lasting ramifications. 
And there are other examples in the book of things that are, you know, events that are even smaller than Ringo not filling in an application form. For example, if Paul, Paul, um, Paul had to repeat a year at school. And so he was held back a year, mm. which meant that he was suddenly in a class with kids slightly younger than him, including George Harrison. So if Paul hadn't had to repeat a year at school, he would never probably have developed a, a close friendship with George mm. because George and Paul were actually quite different. They were like really different. We always talk about Paul and John being different, mm. but Paul and John, as we've said, had things that brought them very close together. George and Paul were arguably the, the, the most different in the group. We haven't talked about George yet, no. but anyway, like they, they did become friends just maybe due to proximity. The fact that they were in the same class, they took the same bus and they were into the same kind of music. So if he hadn't been in the same classroom as George, they might not have bonded as, as friends. Yeah. And George would probably never have joined the Beatles. Mm. Right. And similarly, the thing with Ringo. So, you know, little moments, little events have huge consequences. It's just weird. Yeah, that's uh, right. That's the butterfly effect. The idea that a butterfly flaps its wings and the the effects of the flap of the wing cause exponential changes through time and space yeah. yeah everything has consequences yeah that cause history to just go you know change shape completely yeah, yeah. i mean we can all think of things like that in our own lives can't we yeah every in fact every single moment mm. arguably every single tiny moment arguably creates a different yeah. chain of events and there are some theories that you know, there are multiple universes all constantly branching off from themselves. Oh, uh, yes. Let's not go there, Luke. <laughs> <laughs> Enough. <laughs> uh, um, uh, what about George then, Mum? Um, oh, yes. I suppose George is someone I know whose childhood I know least about. He seems to have had a pretty stable childhood, pretty, you know, working class, nothing special. Yeah, uh, but he didn't seem to have had any great traumas or anything in his life. Of course, he becomes more interesting the older he gets. Early on, I was a John and Ringo fan in the early days. Yeah, less so Paul. I never really called myself a Paul fan, you know, in the 60s. And George was just sort of there. He, uh, I didn't, he didn't have a huge impression on me individually. But as as I've got older and as he got older and got into more interesting things, I've been more and more interested in him. And I think, you know, he's possibly my favourite now because of his spirituality and his interest in India and the fact that he got he became friendly with the Monty Python lot and he financed a lot of the handmade films, you know, the Monty Python films and, oh, various films. And my uh, Alan Bennett film, Private View, I think, was a handmade film. And uh, so that part of him, I think, is fascinating. Yes. Certain things happened in the mid-60s that kind of opened George's mind. Mm. Uh, and I've heard people say that before, I mean, you know, before he, he took LSD uh, and then kind of got into, um, uh, into Indian spiritualism. Yeah. Hinduism, uh, isn't it? Harry Krishna. Yes. Tra let's let's say before he got into transcendental meditation yeah, yeah he was kind of like although he was cute and 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 funny and charming like uh, you know like they all were he was a little bit what's the word for it is it is callous the right word well he was famously uh very keen on looking after his money because he was the one who wrote taxman he hated the fact that they were taxed heavily in the um, Harold Wilson government because they Harold Wilson had a super tax, you know, for people who were very wealthy. Um, and uh, George famously hated that <laughs> and was very keen on protecting his money and that sort of thing. Yeah. So, so <clears throat> arguably he was a bit of a stingy sort of Person, I don't but, know. That's know, the story. I, I wouldn't. I think it's fairly reasonable to yeah. try and you know protect your to protect yeah. your interests like that. You know, yeah. uh, it's probably not fair to just then say that he's a miser and a stingy no. bastard or anything. Um, but what am I trying to say? That that George had a habit of being a bit blunt and a little bit um, insensitive 
and a little stubborn. Yes, but he maybe. had this. He had this side to him. Well, he was famous for um, a fa- one or two things, but uh, interestingly, Craig Brown wrote a book about Princess Margaret, which is equally well written as this one. Um, but George appears in that because. Um, Princess Margaret was famously rude in that it, when she went to um, events, you know, functions and things, people weren't allowed to sit down and eat until she did. And she used to turn up and, you know, drink her gin or whatever and smoke cigarettes and go around talking to everybody and holding court. And everybody was starving. And apparently there was an event that the Beatles were invited to that she was she was there. And that that's what happened. She refused to or was it that she had to leave before they could eat? I can't remember. No, anyway, it was, it's exactly as you were saying that um, everyone was starving, yeah. especially the Beatles, because they'd probably been working yeah, their, their right. asses off. And everybody was too scared to say to her, look, we need to eat. Can you come and sit down and eat? But George went up and said, look, we're all starving. We can't eat until you do. So will you come and eat? And she did, apparently. And it, yeah. was, it took George to do that. Which is, yeah, um, George was always the one who seemed to put his foot down. Yeah, he was always the one who said no. Yeah, and he was always the one who fought to to get Ringo into to the band. Oh, right. yeah. uh, he he also refused. He he had tried to refuse to perform with another replacement drummer. Ah, so when yeah. Ringo got sick and they were doing a tour of Australia, Ringo was replaced for about a week. Is this the Jimmy Nickel one? Jimmy Nickel, yeah. another fascinating story. Yeah. <laughs> um, and and so Jimmy Nickel was brought in, uh, or they tried to, and George was like, "No, we're not doing it without Ringo. Yes. It's not the same. It's yeah. not the Beatles without Ringo." So he put his foot down. He would always, he was quite um, forthright, and that's quite nicely illustrated. I don't know if you remember in um, Hard Day's Night, when they go to this trendy party and there's all these painful people around, and he somehow gets hived off and finds himself in a. I can't remember how it happens, and he's in the, an office of a. PR firm or something, and they're trying to show him some items that they want him to promote. And they show him a, um, a, a shirt and, you know, want to get his impression. Because obviously they want to use him in the adverts. And he just looks at it and he says, I think it's grotty. <laughs> I think they're all dead grotty. Um, yeah, he stumbles into some sort of advertising yeah, agency yeah. and he meets this uh, uh, nauseating yes. advertising guy yeah. who is um, – he makes it his job to kind of set new trends. Mm, that's right. And um, that with his advertising and stuff, he's like telling teenagers what late, what the latest fashions will be and what they will buy. And um, George completely punctures mm. his um, his pomposity. He won't be drawn in. Yeah, and, mm. and he's like, you know, tell us what you think of these shirts. I think they're all dead grotty. <laughs> and, yeah, very straight talking. Yeah. It's a wonderful scene. I love that yeah. scene. And George is very funny and, yeah. and perfect in it. Yeah. We'd like you to give us your opinion on some clothes for teenagers. Oh, by all means, I'd be quite prepared for that eventuality. Well, not your real opinion, naturally. It'll be written out and you'll learn it. Can you read? Of course I can. I mean lines, Ducky. Can you handle lines? Well, I'll have a bash. Good. Give him whatever it is they drink. A cocorama? A Well, at least he's polite. Show him the shirts, Adrian. Now, you'll like these. You'll really dig them. That tab and all the other pimply hyperboles. I wouldn't be seen dead in them. The dead grotty. Grotty? Yeah, grotesque. Make a note of that word and give it to Susan. It's rather touching, really. Here's this kid trying to give me his utterly valueless opinion when I know for a fact that within a month he'll be suffering from a violent inferiority complex and loss of status because he isn't wearing one of these nasty things. Of course, they're grotty, you wretched nit. That's why they were designed, but that's what you'll want. I won't. You can be replaced, chicky baby. I don't care. And that pose is out too, Sonny Jim. The new thing is to care passionately and be right wing. Anyway, if you don't cooperate, you won't meet Susan. And who's this Susan when she's at home? Only Susan Campy, our resident teenager. You'll have to love her. She's your symbol. Oh, you mean that posh bird who gets everything wrong? I beg your pardon. Oh, yeah, the lads frequently sit down the television and watch her for a giggle. In fact, once we all sat down and wrote these letters saying how gear she was and all that rubbish. She's a trendsetter. It's her profession. She's a drag, a well-known drag. We turn the sound down on her and say rude things. Get him out of here. Have I said something amiss? Get him out of here. 
He's knocking the program's image. Sorry about the shirt. Get him out! Yeah, that scene does kind of capture something about George. But what was I trying to say? Is that he was a little bit shallow as well in some ways. Um, and he was young. I mean, he was, you know, he was in, he was in his early 20s. I know. Incredibly young. For most of those years. But then when acid came into his life and then he got into transcendental meditation and he suddenly became incredibly uh, deep yes. and wise and yeah. mystical yes but yeah an interesting character george i mean he's he's been described as a dark horse what i understand after having read about it and listened to people talk about him and stuff there were various different georges mm. so there was the playful funny george who liked nothing other than just like having a laugh mm. and making jokes and spending time with his comedy friends. And he was really good company. And then there was the, there was the spiritual side, the deep mystical um, spiritual person who, who believed wholeheartedly in, in reincarnation and meditation and, and very cosmic things. And then there was another side of George, which was very grumpy uh, a very uh, like a, a grumpy, moody git, and you didn't want to get on the wrong side of him because mm. he could be very cutting and and just you know a bit bad tempered. So apparently, according to friends, if you went to visit George, you were kind of like wondering which one you were going to yeah. get. If you were going to get this holy man, or if you were going to get this this comedian, yeah. or if you were going to get this just a grumpy git that yeah. wants to be left alone. He was also, I think, towards the end of his life, quite paranoid because he had various. A break-ins at his house in Henley, didn't he? Including that guy who attacked him. There was one particular time, one particular break-in. So, yeah, his home was broken into. Mm. And similarly to, to how John was killed by a, yeah. let's say, a crazy fan, right? A, actually a mentally ill mm. uh, person uh, who decided that he had to kill John Lennon for mm. whatever reason. George also was subject to the same thing. Mm. And George, yeah, was quite paranoid. Mm. I mean, because it's quite reasonable if you've got to that level of fame where you can't walk down the street and everyone's trying to get at you all the time. And one of your best mates has been shot in the street. Mm. You know, one of your band members mm. has been shot in the street that you might also reasonably uh, be concerned for your own safety. Understandable, which is... Sorry, to go back to Paul, it makes Paul even more unusual that he's quite happy just to walk into a, an art shop in Rye, you know, to buy some art materials, just wanders around and everybody knows him in Rye and he just walk, walks around like a normal person. He doesn't seem to worry about that kind of thing, about security. It's, and It's weird. How can Paul get away with it? But other yeah. people, yeah. I don't know, it's like, Maybe George was worried because George felt that he attracted mm -hmm. certain kind of w weird people that maybe because of the, I mean, you know, to talk in psychobabble, mm -hmm. the vibe that George put out into the world, people would seem to pick up on, on that uh, odd people would seem to pick up on it mm -hmm. and that maybe he was scared that he would be attracting kind of odd people to him for whatever reason mm. it's it's a, it's a weird thing there is some paranoia and, and darkness in the story mm. you know um, oh yeah when you get into that stuff but yeah george uh, a, a person broke into his home in the middle of the night and the guy was um in on some he was not on drugs but he was experiencing some kind of psychotic episode and he was convinced that george had to be killed that he was mm. um a wizard uh, of dark magic or something something really horrible mm. and scary and um apparently george was in bed with his wife he heard a noise george uh, george's wife's mum was staying with him at the time oh, yeah. and apparently george was like oh i'll go and sort it out being a kind of macho yeah, yeah. alpha male yeah. <laughs> you know like i'm the protective man yeah. i'll go and i'll go and sort it out and this guy was in was in the house and apparently there was a statue in their home with a the statue had a blade uh, or a spike and uh. the guy had grabbed this blade ah. and George, he attacked George and stabbed him a number of times. But it was his wife who fought him off, wasn't it? O o Olivia yeah. came to his rescue. I mean, yeah. it's a horrific story. Oh God, it must've been appalling. O o Olivia sort of jumped on the guy's back mm. and was hitting him and, and she managed to grab the, the, the weapon and she attacked this guy with the weapon mm. trying to defend her husband and herself and you know there must have been a lot of blood oh. and a lot of a lot of injury for for everybody terrible and 
I mean, it didn't kill George. He survived, but he he was weak anyway because mm. he he had been diagnosed with cancer. Yeah. And you know, people say that this was such a shock and such a physical shock that Must have um, exacerbated it. It exacerbated his his condition, mm. and yeah, he he did pass away a few years after that. Mm. But oh my god, you know, two yeah. out of four. I know. Two of them just yeah. murdered by yeah people, and that that's that's just how 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 big and how how weird it all yes. got. Yes. Oh yes, it, it it was incredibly weird. I, I want to keep talking to you about this, Mum. I feel like there's so much more that we haven't covered. This is Maybe. what I was saying in the introduction that I've been wanting to talk about the Beatles. There's so many stories and things, mm. but um, but it, it, it's too big and mm. I can't handle it. I'd have to do a whole other podcast just about the Beatles. Mm. And I can't do that because there are already enough of them in the world. There's yeah. loads of Beatles podcasts. Yeah. So I don't know. What else? Do you want to add anything else? We could we could keep talking. I mean, if people want to stop, they can just stop. We can keep well, going. Well, the things I liked reading were some of the little incidental things like coincidences about people who just sort of touch their lives in a tangential way. For example, the most amazing one is the man who killed John Lennon's mother by accident. He knocked her, she walked in, uh, allegedly she walked in front of his car. He was an off-duty policeman. He was only young. He wasn't a full policeman. He was just a probationer, I think. And he wasn't, he wasn't drunk, which is no, no, a no. thing that, this is a sort of one of those things that, uh, a myth that's come yeah. out that the guy was drunk. He wasn't yeah. drunk. No, he wasn't. And he wasn't speeding, apparently. I think she must have, um, part of the, Blame for the accident was probably down to her. She probably wasn't looking where she was going or something. Who knows? Anyway, the fact is that the person who, who whose car hit her and she died afterwards was a young probationer, probationary policeman. And, of course, he lost his job after this happened. The police sacked him. And afterwards, he became a postman. And he delivered fan mail to Paul McCartney's childhood home, Fourth Lynn Road, when he yeah. was a postman isn't that weird and and the account that this guy gives in the story is that every time he approached fourth lynn road mm. and paul mccartney's dad's house mm. to deliver post he would think about what happened with john's mum yeah. the, the, the 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 car accident that yeah. had happened Awful. Uh, and in fact the guy never he kept it a secret mm. must have from done. his yeah. from his family oh really he never told his family I don't know which chapter is that in the oh, book. I don't know. I, can't remember. I don't know. But anyway, yeah, it turns out the guy never told his family yeah. and he kept it a secret all these years. Yes. I don't know how, I don't know how the story ends up in the book and where the information comes from, whether Craig Brown actually found this guy and interviewed mm. him. Mm. No, uh, I, don't I don't think know. so. I don't know. But yeah, but, but that's a weird, weird thing. Yeah. yeah. That the, the, he ends up, Going to Paul's house every Paul. every day, yeah. delivering fan mail to Paul. And um, and another little thing about that story is that, do you know the date on which John's mother was killed? Uh, no, I don't. 15th of July. 15th of July. Which is my birthday. It's your birthday. Whoa, <laughs> hey. everything's connected, yeah. man. Um, and another one, <laughs> just a little tangential one, doesn't mean anything to anybody, but I just liked it, was um, their last concert on the roof of the Apple building. The young policeman, who again a policeman, was sent up to find out what was going on and try and get them to stop the noise. Um, he was a young probationer as well. His name was Ken Wharf. And later in later life, he became the personal protection officer of Princess Diana. <laughs> really? Yes. He was the personal protection officer of Princess Diana. Yeah, her, um, Security guy, guard. Uh, yeah. Isn't yeah. that amazing? Yeah, I it mean, is it, amazing. It's not ch life changing or anything. I just, I just think it's fascinating. But again, you know, Princess Diana, it is interesting. Another kind of person, uh, public. Figure yes, exactly. Who, who whose fame uh, arguably um, destroyed her? Destroyed her in yeah. some in some respect. Yeah. yeah. I I wanted to talk about um, different people in their lives. Yes. I mean, I, uh, I was going to say Jane Jane Asher. We talked about her before. Paul's uh, yes. uh, fiance in the during most of that time. 
one thing that is interesting about her is that she has never, ever given mm. any interviews. She's exactly. never talked about what happened. And I guess she deserves respect for that, that she's kept her privacy. Mm. And his. And his, especially. Yes. That she, out of respect for, for Paul, she has never mm. sort of dished the dirt. Absolutely. I have great, I, I, I think she's, I mean, I always thought she was great. And I, that's just, you know, increased my admiration for her, really, because she could have made a lot of money out of it. She could have made herself famous, you know. She could have done all sorts of things with the stuff that she must know. Um, but she's never mentioned him, as far as I know, she never mentioned him at all. And a bit later on, she got married to... Um, Gerald Scarf. Gerald Scarf, that's right, the uh, cartoonist. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, sort of satirical cartoonist. Yeah, um, yeah really interesting person. I'd love Dana to talk Asher. to her and ask her what it was all like and what everyone was like. I'd just love to meet her and just mm. see what she was like. Yeah. She seemed to be really impressive. I know she did. She, didn't she do like a cooking show yeah. on TV? She was a big, she, before Mary Berry, <laughs> she used to, um, she was into cakes, did a lot of cake baking and decorating and things. She did that mm. for a while. But no, she's very um, self-possessed, very self-contained, very calm. Yeah. Interesting. Um. <sighs> I can't talk about everyone. What about Yoko? Yoko Ono, how does she come out of the book? Well, she doesn't come out of it very well. It's interesting because we Beatles fans tend to look upon her with dislike. <laughs> you know, she's blamed for all sorts of things, probably unfairly, because she certainly had a big inf a effect on John and was probably good for him, although I'm not sure, because she did introduce him to some quite, you know, to drugs and things. Heroin, heroin. Heroin, specifically. Know, did she... Did she introduce him to heroin? I don't know. Well, she certainly didn't distract, you know, didn't stop him doing it. <laughs> yes, yes. They did it together. Craig yeah. Brown uh, obviously doesn't like her and thought that she was very scheming and that she had a plan to meet John and that she went out of her way to make sure that she met him and got mm. involved with him. The official John and Yoko account of how they met is not really true. No. That John and Yoko's account is this romanticized, it's essentially fiction, yeah. which was basically that uh, Yoko was doing a, an exhibition mm. of her work in a gallery, the Indica Gallery in London, and that Yoko didn't know the Beatles. Yes. And she didn't know who, who this person was. She didn't know who John was. She didn't know the Beatles or that maybe the only thing she knew about the Beatles was, was Ringo because Ringo means apple in yeah. Japanese, which is cute. Um, but, uh, but she didn't know the Beatles and that the, her first introduction to them was when she met John, who was just this guy who came to her exhibition yeah. and looked around this self-important guy. And the uh, gallery owner said to her, look, you know, this guy's a millionaire, you know. Mm -hmm. You know, you should probably let him look at your, your work because the exhibition hadn't been opened yet. And they met and there's this like little flirtation where um, John like looked at s s one of the works of art. There was an apple mm. and uh, an apple on display, a real apple displayed as a work of art. And John said, can I take a bite out of the apple? And Yoko said, no, you can't. And... um what was it he said and i think he said can i take well then i'll take an Im imaginary uh, bite no that's it uh, what about if i pay you five pounds for it and she said no but you can pay me an imaginary five pounds or something like that <laughs> and then he said how about i i um i take an imaginary bite out of the apple some some other yeah, some exchange yeah. like that i'm sorry i'm not i can't remember it word yeah. for word but that this was like this little playful kind of game that they played with each other and that's the moment click that they fell in love with each other and the, the their artistic collaboration and their love affair kind of you know went from there but the fact is like yoko knew who the beatles were mm -hmm. and in fact she'd been trying to get funding she'd been trying to get members of the beatles to to uh contribute some money to something and hadn't she tried to get in touch with one of the others 
Yeah, first of all, she knocked on Paul's door. Ah, uh, yeah. She knocked on his door and said, yeah. "Hi, you know, could you uh, off, uh, you know, provide some funding for yeah. this project?" And Paul, I think, sort of said no, <laughs> but he said, "You know, you might want to speak to John. Sounds yeah. like the sort of thing John might be interested in." Yeah. And um, and then she was trying to get to John, and first of all as far as John was concerned, or well, this is what he said to Cynthia. Mm. Cynthia was John's wife. And she's written about this in her, in her book, uh, that, uh, John said, Oh, she's just a crazy fan mm. to, to Cynthia. And there was one moment where John and Cynthia were getting into the back of their car, their limousine. Yoko jumped in the car too. Right. She literally threw herself into the car and, I don't know if she sat between them or something, but it's something kind of um, symbolic yeah. that she leapt into the car too. And John was like nonplussed, like mm. looking at Cynthia like, huh, I don't know what's going on. Mm. And, um, and this is before, I think this is before he actually went to the exhibition mm. and then they kicked off their relationship properly. So it's something that it wasn't quite as simple mm. as the, the, the story that they told. So yeah, yeah, Yoko doesn't come out of the book very well, yeah. and Craig Brown sort of suggests that maybe even as an artist, she was yeah. she was she was not really a great artist, and that she ripped and that she was very wealthy in in her own right, and uh, you know that her husband and her family and everything were financing all these artistic flights of fancy that she had, so she didn't even need the funding really, but that she I don't know. She she just wanted to meet John and she went out of her way to make sure that she did. And that John, to begin with, was just irritated by it because she kept pestering him. That's the impression that Craig Brown gives anyway. Yeah, I mean, the case against Yoko is that she was um, not a very good artist, that she kind of uh, didn't even have original ideas, mm. that a lot of her ideas had been done before, and that she was just a spoilt, rich Japanese girl who just wanted to be respected as a great artist. Mm. And she used John Lennon to kind of give herself a platform. Mm. And she she controlled him mm. and sort of that she even introduced him to heroin as a way of controlling him and other things. Mm. This is a very mean um, like version of, yeah. of the story. And I'm sure it's not quite as simple as that. Yeah. I mean, I think he, Craig Brown, probably suffers from the same. Confirmation bias. Confirmation yeah. bias. That we have always thought that she was to blame for the breakup of the Beatles and that, you know, she wasn't good for John and all that kind of thing. And it's um, it's not necessarily the full story. You could also argue that John was using Yoko, yeah. that he used her as a means of controlling um, the, the situation. And when I say the situation, I mean the situation in the Beatles mm. and just generally his life, mm. that he kind of took Yoko as this extraordinary, totally different thing mm. and used her for sort of leverage as a way of like kind of trying to get some level of control over the craziness that was in his mm. life and as a way of like levering himself out of the situation. Mm. And I think John, you could argue that John was um, almost in a state of, of emergency in some ways. Mm. Oh yeah. Uh, men mentally and in yeah. his life, yeah. especially as everything had fallen apart after Brian Epstein, that the Beatles manager had died and John was like really badly sort of mentally screwed up. I think yeah. with, with um, the fact that he'd been taking too much LSD and that mm. he was in a, he was actually at a crisis point. Mm. There is a specific moment when, I think that like, he took a, 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 a trip with Derek Taylor um, one of those sort of members of staff mm. who worked at Apple and a close member of the group. Um, Derek Taylor describes this moment where John and Derek took acid together and they took too much or John took too much. Mm. And he, 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 his, his ego, you know, his, his psyche started to kind of unravel and break down. And he got to the point where he was, he totally lost himself and he'd lost faith in himself and he, he, he was so low and down and saying, I'm rubbish. I'm crap. I'm nothing. Mm. I'm not even a great, I'm not a great artist. I'm rubbish is how bad he felt. Mm. And Derek had to kind of reprogram him mm. that, that night, you know, and sort of 
say to him, you're, no, you're a great artist. Look, you know, and show him his work and say, look, this is what you did. And, and you are strong and you're somebody. Mm. John was in a terribly fragile state. Mm. And I think that he didn't have control in his life. Mm. Especially as Brian had, Brian Epstein, the manager, was an interesting character because, in a to an extent, John had kind of some level of control over Brian because Brian very interesting relationship between those two. Brian loved John. Mm. Uh, Brian was gay, and I don't know if even being gay was anything to do with it. But I mean, Brian was completely he was quite obsessed with John, and he he loved him very much. And I think that John had some odd level of control over this situation. John was very manipulative. Mm. He was able to take situations and control them. And he kind of uh, was a, you know, with Brian in, in charge, John felt like he had an agent looking out for his interests in a, in a, to an extent, you know, mm. I think. Uh, and then when Brian died, that was gone mm. and everything kind of fell out of control. And Paul kind of stepped in because Paul was growing in confidence mm. more and more. Mm. And Paul stepped in and started to control things and musically became a lot more dominant. And John, you know, it, it really kind of freaked out, freaked John out. And maybe he was using Yoko mm. as a way of kind of upsetting the situation and manipulating the situation to, you know, that's why he brought her into the studio yes, yes, and stuff right. like that. So it's not just Yoko. No. It was John <clears throat> as much as anything else. Terrible situation, really. Yeah, I mean, the, you you definitely get that from the book. The, mm. Just the pure madness. Oh, of, absolutely. Of the Apple yeah. period oh, when they totally. set up this company to try and avoid tax and yeah. stuff. Absolute nightmare. Mm. Everything just went completely haywire. So oh, there's so, so many other stories which we can't tell. <laughs> no. But I would love to tell the story of of the Maharishi and what oh, happened no, with him. Don't, uh, well, that's for another one. It's another story for yeah. another time. Maybe yeah. we can come back and do this again. Yeah. <laughs> okay all right it's time to stop i think well, your visitors will be getting your sorry your listeners will be getting very fed up no they won't you know, some of them might but they will have just stopped but <laughs> others are like no 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 i don't want this to stop i promise there are some people who are thinking that but okay. anyway okay you're right we must mm. we must stop this uh mum thank you very much for talking to it's very us. enjoyable yeah um and uh let's talk again soon yeah okay then All right. All right. Take care. Bye for now. Bye. Take care. Bye. So there you have it. After more than 700 episodes, I finally returned to the topic of the Beatles with my mum. And I think it's fair to say that we went into quite a lot more depth than we did in episode three back in 2009. Although episode three does include stuff we didn't mention here. Specifically, my mum's account of actually seeing the Beatles perform live on stage twice. So check out episode three if you haven't done so. Also, you could check out that episode in which I asked my uncle Nick to tell us about the time he met Paul McCartney. You heard my mum and me mention that, that moment. Well, Nick was on the podcast once telling the story. Uh, He told the story in episode 414. And not only has he met Paul, he's also played football with the members of Pink Floyd and hung out with The Who backstage at one of their concerts. He met Pete Townsend and Keith Moon and more people as well. So check out episode 414 as well if you want to hear those stories. You'll find links for those episodes on the page for this one on my website, of course episode three and episode 414. So I really hope you enjoyed listening to this episode. I must admit that although I feel compelled to talk about this subject at length, part of me is concerned that this is all too much for my audience. And this is only the first episode in a five episode series. I don't know if I'll I'll publish them all back to back. I'll probably spread them out a bit. But anyway, I do, I feel compelled to talk about the Beatles, but I'm concerned that this is all a bit too much for my audience. But, you know, I suppose those people who aren't into this can just skip this stuff, right? I mean, it's completely up to you. But do let me know what you think. Remember, anytime you have any thoughts about what you're hearing on this podcast, if you have responses or comments in your head as you listen, you can express them in English. 
And I will read those comments and so will many other Lepsters. And the best place to leave your comments is on the page for the relevant episode on my website, teacherluke.co.uk. Go to episodes in the menu and find the relevant episode page. Scroll to the bottom and that's where you'll find the comment section. I am curious to see what you think. Any Beatle fans, get in touch, all right? And, you know, add your thoughts and stuff too if there are any things you'd like to add. Uh, non Beatle fans, I want to know what you are thinking. Remember, sometimes doing this podcast is a bit like talking into the void. In other situations where I talk to people, for example, if I'm a teacher in a classroom, I can actually see the people I'm talking to and I get a sense of what they're thinking and their, what their reactions are and if they are falling asleep or, you know, if they've got questions and things like that. If I'm doing stand-up comedy and I've got an audience of people in front of me, similarly, I am constantly like, you know, looking at the audience and just kind of like trying to read the room. But doing this, I mean, I've been doing it for over 12 years now, so I should be used to it. But still, doing this, you do always get that feeling that you're just kind of talking into, into the void talking into um, a sort of just a dark, empty space, although there are thousands and thousands of people on the other side listening to this. But it's, it's quite an odd feeling. I've talked about this before. I just sit here in my room with my microphone and my computer. Most of the time, I'm on my own, unless I have a guest. But anyway, I'm always curious to know what you're thinking. Okay, I won't talk much more at, at the end here, except that, of course, there are millions of things I wish I could have mentioned or talked about in this conversation. Um, here are some things that perhaps we didn't talk about. So we didn't talk enough about Ringo, and I feel like there's plenty of other things that could be said about, about Ringo. And there are also loads of other people and events I wanted to mention. But I guess, you know, there's only a certain amount of talking that can be done in one single episode anyway about the Beatles and their story. As I said twice, it's epic. It's an epic story. And if it's, if it, I mean, if it ever got dramatised, which would be a bad idea, I hope it doesn't ever get dramatised like The Crown or something, because I don't know, I can't stand sort of dramatised versions of the Beatles story. They're always pretty awful. But if the, if it ever did get dramatised, it could be a sort of a, a 10 season epic um tv series i don't think it needs to be dramatized you can just read the books and listen to the podcasts and watch the beatles anthology and stuff and you know that's the 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 real drama is is in the history of it uh but anyway there are loads of other people and events that i wanted to mention but i suppose i can always come back to those things i hope i didn't talk too much uh this is a conversation with my mum but i think i probably spoke about 65 percent of the time but I mean, I said that to my mum afterwards, after we'd finished the call. I was like, oh dear, I think I spoke too much. I spoke more than you. And she said, yeah, but it, you know, it's your podcast, isn't it? So I suppose it's okay. And yes, just in case this wasn't quite enough rambling about the Beatles on this podcast. Remember, there are four, count them, four more episodes on the Beatles to come. And probably others in the future too. Okay, but hopefully those episodes will be different enough to justify this series. It's not just going to be, well, there will be some rambling, but also there will be specific takes on this topic and language focused stuff too. Uh, Four more Beatle episodes coming. One is a discussion about John Lennon with a a sort of a Beatle expert. I'm going to call him a Beatle expert. I mean, a John Lennon expert, because he's read all the books, he's done all the interviews, and I mean, the guy has even spoken to people who were friends with John Lennon, people who worked with him and stuff. So I've got a conversation with him coming up, a discussion about John Lennon. And then another two with the same guy are language-focused. By the way, the guy I'm talking about is called Anthony Rotuno, and he does a podcast called The Glass Onion. It's actually called Glass Onion on John Lennon. And uh, I heartily recommend it. It's very good. So... Uh, discussing John Lennon with Anthony and then another two episodes with Anthony and they are language focused. Anthony is an English teacher too, which is great. So two more language focused episodes and we'll be talking about adjectives for describing personality traits. And we'll be using John Lennon as a, as a sort of context for that. And then the last one is about Beatles song lyrics 
and little phrases and idioms that you can learn from Beatles songs. And that's with Anthony as well. So he's a John Lennon sort of expert. Expert? Uh, I would say so. He certainly, I think he knows probably all there is to know about John, at least sort of the vast majority of stuff that is out there uh, about John Lennon. So yeah, he's a John Lennon expert. And he's an English teacher. He's also a musician. He plays guitar. And so in that episode about the song lyrics, Anthony has the guitar and he sort of sings little extracts from the songs. I think you'll like it. So it's not just rambling about the Beatles, although that will be part of it too. Okay, right. So I should say again, thanks to my mum for her great contribution to this episode. And yes, I am lucky to have a mum who is this cool. I appreciate that, and I'm really glad to get her voice on the podcast, along with my other guests. And thank you, as ever, for listening all the way to the end. You are the best. And take care, look after yourselves and each other. And I will speak to you again soon. I think the next episode will be Michael from Poland, another Wispolep runner-up, another Wispolep runner-up. And of course, I've got plenty of LEP premium episodes in the pipeline. But anyway, until next time, it's now time to say goodbye. Bye, 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 bye. Thanks for listening to Luke's English Podcast. For more information, visit teacherluke.co.uk.